Okay, I don't know how the word in English, but DAC, if it was okay for DAC, DAC is the OECD organization for uh, ODA. All right. So, and they have, the DAC has, they have special rules. And if it was, the rules was according to. Uh, okay. Yeah. So that should be the answer. It is, so I found that out. But the, so that means that. They are still yeah, looking into this. Okay, yeah, right. yeah. At least a small sign. Okay. They haven't thrown it away. They are so anything that's going looking into five money at least. Yeah. And when I said I yes, both that. are, uh, that means that they, uh, it's easier for them to find money because oh, so I'm to talk to Sorry. For, yeah. I was actually hoping to meet you, sir. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, yes. That, that, let, let, me, let me just. Now everybody can hear me here because this is the microphone for the room, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> I put this, I put this over here. Okay. Yeah, is that okay? Let me know where they are. You're welcome to come a little bit closer if you want. It's uh, quite empty in the front. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this session on, on PFAN. My name is uh, Michael Rantil. I'm a PFAN for, uh, from, uh, sorry, I'm a, a CTI manager uh, for PFAN. And um, as you may know, uh, CTI has uh, developed the PFAN activity for some eight years now. And uh, PFAN is right now in the transition phase. Uh, we will uh, end our support of SUPIFAN in uh, next month, and uh, a new organization, UNIDO with REAP, will take over the responsibility. And uh, this is that we in CTI believe that uh, REAP, together with UNIDO, will uh, have much better chances to uh, make uh, PFAN grow. Um, PFAN, or UNIDA has already had a, 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 a meeting with their board for the trust fund, and they had an integration of uh, official integration last week uh, during the Energy Week in Vienna. So we have two speakers today. Um, first, uh, Martin Hiller, Director General for REAP, who will uh, 
tell us about the, the setup for the, the institutional setup for PFAN under UNIDO. Uh, basically, and then after that, uh, Peter Story, global coordinator for PFAN, will uh, <clears throat> let us uh, tell us about the current situation uh, and um, how. PFAN will grow in the f rapid, rapidly in the future. So with that, I give the word to Martin. And um, you may interrupt. I think it's uh, quite informal, uh, small group. So you can, uh, I guess, uh, interrupt Martin if you have some question for, for better understanding. And then we'll follow up with more questions afterwards. The same with Peter later on. So I give the word to you, Peter, Martin. Thank you, Michael. Uh, welcome to uh, all of you. Uh, thank you for following this, uh, uh, this side event. I think PFAN has had side events in the context of the bond meetings probably forever, actually, since, uh, since P in the last 10 years. Every time in May or June, we have come back and, uh, and reported uh, on progress uh, about the private financing advisory network. Uh, this time, the uh, the report back is really to um, inform you about the change of institutional setup and the scale up plans for this network where we are today um, and where we want to go. I'm just briefly going to outline the institutional uh, framework, as Michael has said up to now. The Climate Technology Initiative was the institutional host and the platform for uh, the PFAN network uh, was a, an organization in Japan, the International Center for Environmental Technology Transfer, ISET. Uh, ISET is, continues to be involved, Japan continues to be involved, uh, but it was seen as necessary uh, uh, to for for growing PFAN to move the organization to a new uh, a new platform provided by Unido and Reap. Why is that? Well, PFAN is really a network, as the name says, private financing uh, advisory network. It's a network of private advisors, investment advisors. All of those are indep independent companies. So PFAN isn't actually working with business. PFAN is business. Um, and this network, these different uh, private finance advisors and investment advisors need to have some kind of institutional hub, uh, which uh, provides the, the basis um, for, um, for the operation of PFAN. Um, PFAN has been building up over the last 10 years, a very, very cautious way in terms of resource use. That's why the ratios of money in, money spent on PFAN uh, and money leveraged in terms of investments are very, very high. Um, and Peter will go into that a little bit more. But uh, now there was a point where we needed to create a trust fund in UNIDO into which governments can uh, uh, put funding more easily and rethink the um, the, the backstage organization, if you want, the complete workflow management, the knowledge management, and the business analytics, um, and the monitoring, evaluation, and learning. Um, uh, uh, and that's the, the part that uh, REAP takes over. Um, chart that uh, we have a steering committee. The steering committee is essentially uh, provided by the major donor governments. Uh, those are on, on the steering committee and the major donor governments now are um, in, I'm trying to do this in alphabetic order, let's see if, if I can work it out. Uh, Australia, Japan, Norway, and the US. Uh, funding is also coming from Sweden um, and uh, there are a number of other governments very interested in possibly uh, uh, joining joining PFAN. So, so in that sense, the scale up has already been uh, successful, as more governments are now coming into into supporting uh, the work that we are doing. Um, 
we you see then underneath the duality of the backstage organization with UNIDO, uh, as I said, the trust fund, the strategic relationships with the multilateral banks and with other multilateral organizations, and also at governmental level, and we provide we in REAP, my organization, providing the um, that the day-to-day -day back, back uh, um, backstage organization. Um, underneath that, and in fact, somehow they should be on top, is that network of private finance advisors, independent business people, as I said. And Peter is one of them. He is actually the one who was at the very beginning of PFAN and has, has have, was instrumental to get it to the space where it's now and to the space where it will be in, in a few years' time. Um, and Peter, I would maybe just hand over to you now to talk a little bit more about what PFAN really does and how we want to scale it. Thank you, Martin. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. And I'll try and walk you through, as Martin says, uh, what it is exactly PFAN does, how we do it, and then looking forward, what our plans are, what our ambitions for, for the future are. So the I'll, I'll just try and step back a little bit. I don't see anybody in the room that I recognize from previous meetings of this nature. Um, and perhaps you're not really, really very familiar with what we do and, and why we do it. And I think the, the situation that we have in financing clean energy, climate businesses at the moment uh, across the developing world is that we've got an, uh, a, a demand side, those are the project developers, the businesses that are looking for investment, uh, but finding it very difficult to find um, for, for whatever reasons. Um, uh, some of those reasons are the fact that there's, there's, there's a lack of capacity, lack of commercial skills, good technology skills perhaps. Um, but one of the things that goes back to the roots of PFAN and the work that CTI did right at the very beginning when we were set up in conjunction with the UNFCCC and the expert group on technology transfer was we really established that there's a huge supply of these sort of projects out there. So we've got the ideas, we've got the concepts. But what we are not very good at doing, or what the developers and the businesses are not very good at doing, is communicating their ideas to the financing community. On the other side, you have the financing community, huge supplies of money in the private sector, always been, has been for a long time. And now, after Paris, after all the work that we've been doing in these rooms here at the UNFCCC over the years, we've also got a huge supply of public money. The GCF is up and running, the CIF is there, the GEF has been there for a long time, the MDBs and the other um, development banks have been doing their stuff. But we're still not very good at getting that money into the right places where it's being used to implement projects and achieve climate goals. Um, at least not quickly enough and not fast enough and not in the, the scale that we need to reach 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees uh, of, 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 of total aggregate climate change rates. So there's frustration on both sides. And what we have as a result of that is essentially what we call in PFAN the missing middle. The two sides don't get together. And if they do get together, the, the development side and the, the finance side, they don't get on very well. So PFAN was essentially created to bridge that gap, to bridge the, the financing gap, as, or the missing middle as we call it, to push to identify firstly the projects that can raise money and can raise private capital, and it's principally private capital that we're talking about. And I, once I identify the projects, we push them towards the, the money and the investment, and we work with the, 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 the buy side as well, the banks, the financial institutions and the investors, to help them get close to the projects. And over the years, we've developed a methodology, which I'll go into in some detail, to actually achieve that and, and, and have the success that we have. Essentially what we do is we provide four very well-defined services through a methodology and we deliver those services through the network that Martin has already mentioned to you. And I'll come back to the network in a little while. The first thing that we do is identify projects now that, that, or, or investments. Now that sounds banal, but it's vitally important. Um, again, you know, the, the, the issue is the investments are out there in the first place, but we need to identify the good ones in inverted commas. Good meaning that they're technology, te technologically viable, that they're commercially viable, and of course that they're meeting the climate goals uh, that, that we set ourselves. Um, so that's the first part of the, the puzzle here, identifying the projects. Once identified, 
we assign one of the experts from our network, uh, from, from the private sector network, to work with those projects and act as a coach or a mentor. Now that relationship is very intensive um, and becomes in, in, you know, extremely powerful for both sides. What we do is, and, and we fund that, PFAN funds that, to be able to provide the advice free at no cost to the project developers and to the businesses. Um, and so we're providing extremely high quality professional advice into these projects and businesses. Now, um, once, and, 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 the, and the, 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 the project coaches or the project consultants then work with the projects over a period of time longer or shorter, depending on the requirements of the project. And these are, uh, these are relationships and scopes of work that are really tailor-made. Um, they work until the project becomes investor ready. And we speak about investor readiness, not necessary bankability for various reasons. Once the project is investor ready, we start introducing it to investors. Now, part of that work is already identifying which are the right investors, because each project has a has a particular risk profile and is attractive only to particular investors. And one of the value adds that we bring as PFAN is to identify and help projects identify to which investor groups they need to be speaking. It's no good, frankly, having a very, you know, a, 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 a very high returning project, say a project returning 30% IRR um, and going to speak to in investment uh, impact investors uh, or philanthropic foundations. You're, you're talking to the wrong investor group and vice versa. Um, and, and we help the project developers and the entrepreneurs understand which investor group they need, to be, they need to be speaking to. When we've targeted that investor, we then make the introduction to the investor and work with the two sides to actually close the deal. Um, we do that through a process called, which we call loosely deal facilitation. It's a lot of support to both sides. It's making sure that the negotiations continue. It's making sure that the two parties don't walk away for whatever reason. And if necessary, it's putting some money on the table to help go through due diligence procedures and meet conditions precedents. Uh, and that's what we call tipping point technical assistance to actually push the projects into financial close and make the deal happen. And that's provided right at the end of the process. To give you an idea of the sort of projects that we work on, we have identified a niche for ourselves that is, I think, quite specific. And I don't think many other or any other institutions are really addressing this in developing countries. And it's broadly what you might define as the SME space. Um, I know that means many, thing, many different things to different people. But for, that, for us, that means that we will look at an investment or a project that has a total investment requirement in the first round of financing of between one to 50 million US or any currency equivalent. We will work with any technology that is reasonably proven in that particular application and we're completely technology neutral. Um, now we're looking obviously for uh, commercial viability and we're obviously looking for technical viability. But the sort of things that we're looking for on top of that are the climate impacts, uh, which we increasingly measure now through SDGs, of course. Um, uh, there's the climate impacts and the development impacts that are so important to us in this room. Um, but having said that, we find that the things that drive the project forward and make the difference in terms of getting investment or not getting investment are the experienced management team that are able to execute on the plans and actually deliver the project and then the growth potential. And that means that we can start with relatively small financing amounts, providing there's a growth story in there that's going to be interesting to the investors at scale in the long term. And to give you an idea of how that works, the smallest amount of money that we've ever raised is for a project in Mozambique, which I think was $85,000. So we can go quite small. But our sweet spot is between one to 50. Uh, we do do some work in, in the smaller micro project space. We're active to give you an idea of, of really the, the spread of the network. We consider ourselves to be a global program and we have networks in all the countries and all the regions that are marked in red on that map. Uh, that means that we have people carrying PFAN cards. We have a country coordinator and under the country coordinator in each country, we have a network of professionals <coughs> that are providing the service that we deliver. Now, those professionals are typically highly specialized, small consultants.
businesses that all have a track record of raising finance in the areas that we operate. So essentially clean energy and climate businesses. Uh, they are quite carefully uh, by PFAN um, before they can join the network. Um, and we rely on them to one source our projects, but also then to work on the projects as we find them. And this is a byproduct of the PFAN process, if you like, because through this mechanism, we are actually creating the local consultancy and financing ecosystems. We're not using flying consultants to work on these projects. 99% uh, of our consultants in the meantime are all in country. So if we're working on a project in South Africa, we are mobilizing and using South African consultancy. If we're working on a project in Costa Rica, it's Costa Ricans that are working on that project and so on and so forth. Uh, the blue countries, um, the countries marked in blue on the map are where we're building new networks and the darker grey is where we are supporting projects but don't yet have a dedicated network. Uh, now I think I can say that we have never turned a project away for geopolitical reasons. Uh, we have always really been able to find resource to support a project assuming that the project meets our criteria and we think that project can go ahead and raise private finance. And that's really the ultimate criteria for what we want to do. Martin and Michael both mentioned that we've been doing this for some time. Uh, we, we sort of date our history back uh, to, to about eight years. And in that time, this is our track record. Uh, we've raised just over 1.2 billion US dollars of financing, which is small, but we're quite proud of it. That represents about 87 projects. And you see those 87 projects equate to about 700 megawatts of uh, clean capacity. Some of that capacity is already installed. Some of it's being commissioned as we speak. And those projects are generating currently about 2.6 million tons of CO2 equivalent per year in mitigation. Um, and that's actually happening. That's, that's what we've done. Let's say some projects already built and operational, some being built with the money that we've raised. Um, now, that's important, but it's not enough. What we're also doing all the time is building our pipeline to be able to bring new projects to close. And that's on the right hand side in the red there, you see the pipeline of projects which we've built up over this years, over these years, which currently represents just around 360 projects uh, and about $8.7 billion, it is $8.7 billion of, of total investment requirement. And our target currently, and in the old PFAN, is to reach closure on about 30% of that. And on a time lagged basis, that's pretty much the track that we're on. In the future, we want to increase that capacity and I'll be spending a little bit of time explaining how we're going to do that. Before we get there, just to show you how the pipeline breaks down in terms of technologies that we support and the regions that we work, uh, this is the big figure, so this is a 360 projects figure uh, and the $8.7 billion of investment and then the same breakdown for the closed projects. And probably there's no real surprises there. We, we're working with the projects that are more commercially advanced or the technologies that are more commercially proven, if you like, and we're working in, in countries and regions perhaps that have better enabling environments, established regimes and so on and so forth. But I would, I would mention that part of the impact of PFAN is actually pushing governments into policy change. Um, so for instance, you know, I come back to Mozambique again, because it's just a, a, a country that I know reasonably well and done personal work in. Um, we've had the impact there of going into a country and helping them develop their policy around uh, biofuels in that instance. And we found, for instance, that we, we had some biofuel projects coming up. Biofuel policy was enacted. Pretty much the day after that policy was enacted, a couple of deals got signed in the PFAN portfolio, showing the very strong links between uh, regulatory environment and, and investment. Over this work, you know, i just give you a, a few ideas of what we're seeing at the moment or what we've seen over these years of activity. I think it's fair to say that you know, clean energy assets, investment assets are increasingly recognized as an investment class in their own right. 
by mainstream investor communities across developing countries and certainly in Europe and, and the developed world. I think you know it's it's almost banal to say in a forum such as this that solar is becoming has become in many markets competitive without any form of subsidy. Uh, you all know that as well as I do, um, and especially when we're talking about rural uh, uh, off-grid electrification applications, seeing a lot of especially around the the solar home systems, um, we're seeing a lot of new models. Uh, distributed energy service companies, distributed renewable energy utility type companies, using intelligent IT backends, pay as you go systems uh, to deliver and service their to deliver products and services to their clients. Um, I think that's becoming very important. We're seeing a lot of those models, and we're becoming familiar with those models. We're bringing those models through to investment. Um, we're still seeing that businesses face working capital gaps in being able to source product and get it to the market quickly enough um, because obviously they're getting paid later than they're having to buy their own equipment. And we're seeing that you know, the technologies of biomass waste to energy uh, are still not quite there on a one-to-one -one basis. And you know, frankly, we find that in many countries, we're struggling to raise investment for some of these sort of projects, partly because of the logistics questions that I think you'll all be familiar with, particularly for biomass projects and partly also for the volatility of pricing in the feedstock supply. You know, as soon as you create a biomass project, the, the waste biomass that had zero value last month suddenly starts to have a value and the farmers want to sell it elsewhere rather than to the biomass plant that you've just put up. So that, that's a big issue. In terms of the instruments that we're seeing, um, I think there's a big lack, and this is a, a really good message to send to this sort of forum or this sort of conference. There's a big lack of mezzanine financing out there. Um, we do lots of equity. Most of the, the, the deals that we do tend to be equity. Uh, equity is useful, but it's not always the most useful and, and appropriate instrument. Uh, debt is problematic because many of the companies that we work with don't have cash flows, they don't have track records, they don't have balance sheets. Difficult for them to raise, raise debt, especially if they don't have collateral to go with that. A banal but important statement for all of us here, uh, the, the banking, the local banking and debt markets are very shallow and illiquid. Uh, we need still to be doing lots more work to develop them and bring them to uh, more liquidity and more maturity. And I think one of the big challenges facing PFAN and a lot of other similar activities in this field at the moment is to develop secondary markets. When we place equity, we're placing it into what I call the primary market, to a private equity investor who in five years time needs to sell that investment to somebody else to make their money. Now, at the moment, we're good at placing that primary investment, but we don't have a secondary market for the exit in five years time. If we don't create that exit, then the primary market's going to collapse and we're not going to be able to do what we need to do. So one of the things for PFAN going forward is to look about not just how we get bigger and do more of what we're already doing, but how do we bring in the mainstream capital markets to create this secondary market and create the liquidity in the assets and the, uh, the projects that we've already reached financial close. And this is what we want to achieve over the next uh, three to five years. Martin mentioned that we just had a steering committee meeting at the end of last year to kick off the new institutional structure. Um, and that steering committee really signed off on the plans to uh, scale up our activity by at least two times, up to five times, hopefully three or four times uh, in the next uh, three to four years. Uh, that means that on a yearly basis, by 2022, we want to be originating about 1,000 projects a year, up from what we're doing at the moment. Originating 1,000, working with somewhere between 300 to 350, and bringing 110 or so projects, maximum 50 to 110 projects, through to financial close on a yearly basis. That's, that's our ambition for the next years. If we do that, and we think we've got the methodology in place to do that through everything else that I've been telling you, we'll be looking at raising, of course, it's imponderable, it's difficult to know what the project averages are, 
but the, the, the total investment that we'd be raising on a yearly basis would be somewhere in the region of a billion dollars a year. So what is taking us 10 years or nearly 10 years to do, we now want to be doing in the future in three or four years time on an almost yearly basis. The reason for wanting to be to, 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 well, the reason for wanting to do that, and the reason for thinking that we can do that, is the supply in the wholesale capital markets. I have had a number of conversations with investment banks in London who are enthused by our pipeline, and their question to me is, Peter, how often can you give us a package of three hundred million? By Three by, by how often, they mean how many times a year. They want it two times or three times a year. So if we can do that, we know that there's the offtake. We know there's the financial supply in the markets to be able to support that sort of, that, that, that project throughput. The question is for PFAN, how are we going to get to that sort of scale? So we have developed three pillars to scale up. Firstly, through the transition to Unido and REAP in, in the new hosting structure, we have been working over the last nine to 12 months on completely industrializing our methodology. Martin and his team, uh, the, the Unido people, have developed, taken the processes that we put together in PFAN over the last years, and we've made out of them using an operating manual, developing standard operating procedures, and expanding the management and administrative support around that. That's, and it's supported by a workflow management system that we've brought in a special piece of software to be able to support that. Um, that is pretty much in place. In fact, we're testing all of that this Friday. It goes live. So we've, we've, that's what we've been, we've been spending sort of the last nine to 12 months on, on establishing. Of course, we also need to expand the networks that I'm, I showed you on the map earlier. That means expanding our footprint, getting more countries, uh, getting more people on the ground, uh, getting more mentors to, to provide the services that we, that we need, um, and increasingly also providing and creating specializations within the network. I'll talk about that in a little while. Um, and finally, the last piece of the picture is moving away from one project for financing facilitation process where we introduce one project to one investor at a time where we actually start putting portfolios of projects together and selling those portfolios essentially on the wholesale capital market through securitization or other bundling techniques. So those are the three pillars of the, of the, of the scale-up strategy. Just go into some of them in more detail. Uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm going over, you'll have to stop me, Martin. Um, you know, here we're, we're talking about sourcing projects in different ways than we do at the moment. At the moment, we source projects through course proposals, through the network. In the future, we're going to be doing that, but we're going to be doing it through larger expanded networks on the one hand, but also working with strategic partners. You know, there are any number of activities that are doing similar stuff to us. We want to be working with them. We're already talking to IRENA. We've got an, a partnership set up with them, obviously the MDBs, the other UN organizations, to, so they can, we can feed off their pipeline of projects and we can feed into their activities as well. And we're going to be refocusing our origination work so that we have continuous calls of site, calls for proposals out, out in, the, uh, in the various regions that we operate. We're looking at creating more efficiency in the, co in the, in the provision of coaching um, through various techniques, obviously looking to support the coaching through uh, communications technology, more webinars, um, moving away from one-to-one -one and doing things on a larger scale. We think all of that is useful. Um, and you know, I think the big thing here is also trying to create the expanded investor base so that once we have investor ready projects we have more investors to show them to finally this you know, i think the real key to this is accessing the wholesale capital markets we're all talking about it at the moment um, you know there are various ideas there's the green bond idea which is certainly one piece of the puzzle but we're going a different route i think you know regardless of which route you go for accessing the wholesale capital markets you need the underlying asset and the thing and that's the project that's the investment 
And that's the thing that PFAN has bought in the past. We know how to source that. We know how to develop it. We know how to prepare it for investment. And we know how to introduce it to the investors such that they can actually work with it. So our piece of the puzzle, if you like, is bringing in that expertise to be able to source the pipelines of investment-ready projects into the wholesale capital markets. We're not going to be doing the packaging. We're not going to be doing the financial structuring. We're going to be working with investment banks in London, New York, or, or Frankfurt, or wherever they might be, to do to provide that, that, that advice. We are just providing the underlying assets that need to go into these investment instruments. The problem being that we've had the investment instruments in the past, fill them with the right assets. The, filling them with the right assets is the piece that PFAN can, can bring to the table. We're looking at a number of options here um, broadly. I won't go into too much detail. It gets into high level financial engineering that e even I don't pretend to understand fully if I'm honest. But I think the most obvious for one, one for us is securitizing. So bundling the portfolios that we have, creating the cash flow or collecting the cash flows out of those projects and then selling the cash flows through various tiers of paper into the wholesale markets. Um, trust funds and fund approaches have been tried. Um, there are problems with them as you know, moving the money is quite difficult. We're looking at a number of option derivatives, uh, option structures that could be quite interesting, and which could actually be worked together with the securitization approach. And then there's the tra traditional investment fund approach. But again, that's proven to have its limitations in the past. Whichever one of these, or it could be a combination of these that we end up working with, I think what we're going to be looking to the other pieces of the climate finance architecture and, uh, and, and, and uh, sort of community. So whether it's the GCF, whether it's the CIF or the MDBs, we're going to be looking to them to provide security enhancement into those packages. I'm finished now, you'll be relieved to hear. Um, uh, just to sort of sum up by saying, you know, PFAN's a real advantage or value add is to create this investment grade pipeline for public and private sector investors. Um, I think we've demonstrated that we understand how to do this. The methodology is proven over a number of years. We're now at a stage where we can scale it up through the funding that we have in place, and which we'll continue to have. We have um, you know, a key linkage with the other institutions in the climate finance architecture. And what Martin mentioned earlier is through this methodology, which is extremely low cost and very effective, we, we, we generate a huge leverage for our donors. So for every $1 of donor financing that we receive, we turn that into about $80 to $100 of finance, mostly private sector finance, which is quite a high leverage ratio. On that, I'll finish and thank you very much for your attention. Of course, we're available for and open for any questions and comments you might have. Thank you. So thank you, Peter and Martin. So it's, um, we open up for questions from the audience. Yes. So uh, my name is Alexander Linke from GIZ. So thank you very much for the interesting presentation. I have two sets of questions. So one, one is the more the operational modalities. So for example, when you select uh, the local investment advisor, so do you have certain criteria how you select him? And uh, during their work, uh, do you have any system in place where you track and monitor the, the, the progress or do you fully rely on them or uh, do you have a kind of a quality management system uh, in place because these are basically external uh, advisors to you? Uh, and then the second question, uh, as you probably know, GSZ is quite a lot working on, on capacity development in, in all our partner countries. Uh, and if I look at your model and also in terms of scaling up this, uh, this model. Uh, do you have any ideas or experience how this support structure of, of local investment consultants could be somehow uh, expanded by embedding it, this into some, I don't know, national institutions or uh, something like that? So do you, in, in terms of your policy advice, also uh, have any practical ideas or activities uh, 
related to upscaling uh, a little bit uh, the activities of these local investment consultants. Thank you. So we could take uh, one more question, if there is one. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, good morning. <laughs> Excuse me, I would like, I'm from Morocco. With my league, where we represent uh, CGM, which is the business uh, confederation, and uh, well, I have two questions. First of all, I appreciate your, I mean, the way how all all the, the activity is arranged. It seems clear, but at the same time, I see some some something which is not clear for me. First of all. If you take, if I give you a comment, like example, Morocco, and if tomorrow you wanted to go and to see what you can do in Morocco, what could be your, your approach? Because you have a country, because you have, of course, a portfolio of project over the world, I mean, in developing countries, I suppose the most important thing is to let them known by private sector SMEs in Morocco, for example, and to 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 let them able to <laughs> to be attracted by your uh, your work. The second point can see, concern the idea of the colleague of GIZ, because now I understand that it will, will be more linked to Unido, and Unido has uh, le centre de développement propre, clean development center. And in, and in Morocco, we have one, I mean, and we suppose that it can play a certain role in this networking. And at the same time, I just inform you that in Morocco, we have a climate Moroccan private sector initiative, which is for, for the moment capacity building program for the SME in particular. And in the program of 2017-18, we have this type of approach, sector by sector, evaluating the mitigation possibilities, elaborating of a portfolio of project mitigation and support SME to go to financing organization, in particular, the Green Carbon Fund. Well, it's not a really a question, it's, there are some points. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for the questions. Uh, oh, okay. uh, sorry, to complete what my, my colleague said, uh, just to tell that uh, CGM is around uh, 88,000 uh, SMEs. And uh, my question is, what's the, the profile of the, 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 your strategic partner in the country? Thanks. Okay, I think uh, the questions are mostly directed to you, Peter. So, Please. We, we, we've sort of divided them up, um, so I'll, I'll t we'll sort of throw them backwards and forwards a little bit and try and um, an answer all the ones that came up in that round. Um, the selection of the coordinators, um, which I think was the question, Alexander. The uh, you know it's, it, it tends to be um, we do have a process for vetting and deciding who who does what. Certainly. Um, that has also been refined or is being refined through the transition to REAP and UNIDO. Uh, a lot of the initial introductions come through references. Um, uh, you know, and it is a network of very close-knit individuals and companies. They tend to be smaller companies. They tend to be, we have tried working with some of the larger consultancies. Frankly, our business model doesn't work for them and their business model doesn't work for us. And we don't think that there is a good fit in the sort of business that we're trying to do if you talk about the, the KPMGs or whoever they might be. So they tend to be quite small, very specialized consultancies. They all have to demonstrate that they've raised money um, or they've advised companies to be able to raise money and have successfully raised money. Um, if we don't know that ourselves, we will check it out. Um, through whatever methods that we that are at our disposal um, and then the actual selection for the country coordinator role or the regional coordinator role is done on a mixture or in the past we've done we've had some situations where they've been put out to tender uh, the one in Asia was 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 it's a, it's a large role and it was put out to tender 
um, under a tender that was run in parallel between PFAN and USAID. Um, and in other situations, it's a process of what you might loosely describe as Darwinian selection. Um, uh, in, in the sense that you're looking for somebody who does business with the network um, and they do more business with us and they become good at what they're doing, they close projects and they position themselves in the center of that particular network to be able to then coordinate it and manage and, and work with us. So it, it's, a, it's a bit of both. Um, Martin, do you want to take the question on quality control, which was, I think was the next one? Yeah, I think, just if I may say, instead of Darwinian selection maybe it's selection by talent right here <laughs> but <laughs> uh, we one of the reasons uh why uh unido and re joined forces to provide this new platform is the focus on monitoring evaluation and learning as we call it in the development community in the academic uh, community uh i Meanwhile, I have discovered that when you talk to business people or to finance people, it's quite good to call it uh, market intelligence and possibly policy intelligence, which when you do it in the right way is actually, you know, the one thing is delivering the other. Uh, so uh, we have spent a lot of time to hone our skills in terms of monitoring, evaluation and learning getting this uh, this intelligence out of of our system uh, of the of the monitoring and evaluation process um we think it's incredibly important we are confronted permanent i'm confronted permanently with the argument that the transaction costs are too high and i think that is a completely absurdly faulty argument because i think this is exactly where the trans the transformation gain sits that is where we can actually create uh, change. So, in fact, we should it, all through climate finance and through development aid, we should not have any project anymore that is not geared towards learning and deriving intelligence about the market. So, so we are pretty radical and pretty, you can hear, rather determined in that. And we think it is important not just to look at the immediate market relevance, but also build in factors such as uh, of course, CO2, uh, um, CO2 behavior, let's say, CO2 performance, um, but also issues such as gender impact on water management impact. You know, if, if you talk about projects within the water energy food nexus, select a, a, a set of criteria where you can start to follow these things. That can be costly and sometimes it can be too costly and it can be very work intensive. So you need to kind of find a, a level that you can actually still still really do. Um, in our tense project call, we have explored this to an extreme level where we where we worked with seven companies in seven different uh, developing countries and monitored them so closely um, that we we then really realized how high the cost can be, how difficult it can also be for an entrepreneur to actually cope with your monitoring endeavor, um, and where you can actually reduce again what you can actually take off and what you need to focus on so we've we've kind of tested this really and learned and that's what we're now implementing for pfan as well peter you described the workflow management system which is a cloud-based system that uh, that runs uh, the complete workflow of each of the projects that pfan works on um it has specific spaces where from the outset on the coach and the company uh, the project developer can actually have their uh, project specific interactions and where you also start with the monitoring and version and learning and, and retrieve the data that are relevant and can kind of carry this through. You can then, you know, at the tail end of that also look at the impact of assessments later on when PFAN has already left. Are these companies actually sustainable? How are they performing further on? So we take it very seriously in the, in the nutshell. <laughs> Yeah, and, and just to follow on from that, I think part of that, we will track the performance of the individuals involved. So, you know, we will know how many projects they've coached, what their closure rate is. Um, we're asking, obviously, feedback from the projects themselves as to how the performance has been, what the benefits have been. And, and you know, I think all of that, we did it in the past. We didn't do it consequently enough. And now through the new structure, We've got a system that's really, uh, I think, rock solid to be able to track it 
monitor it and also in evaluate it and analyze it for our, from our own perspective and use that information to develop and refine our services going forward. So that, that's certainly part of the new, the new process. I think you also asked about how to, and I wasn't quite sure about what you were getting at, but if I understood you, how to embed the expertise into or communicate our learnings into other organizations and, and perhaps other, other governments and, and and, and whether it be developed or developing country governments. And again, I think that's where this, this uh, new structure with UNIDO and REAP comes in. You know, if, if we look at what PFAN has, it has a tremendous body of experience embedded in the projects, embedded in the project documents, and embedded in the sort of experience that we have working with them. In the past, again, I'm doing a bit of disservice to ourselves, but in the past, we haven't really taken that information or used it in any consequent or useful way. In the future, the plan is, as Martin said, to recapture it and then transform it into advice, information products, guidance products that can be communicated in whatever ways to country governments, to policy makers, to investors for that matter, to help inform decisions. That, that's really a part of it. I don't think we want to embed our people in other organizations other organizations might want to employ our people and I would emphasize that we don't own people. We're, we're employing them for a specific task and we're happy for our, our, our PFAN consultants to work for any other organization, assuming they have the time and interest to do that and they can reach terms. Um, and that happens a lot. But we want to take the information that we have, analyze it, and then it's sort of, that's the bit that REAP and UNIDO bring to be able to transform that into useful guidance into whichever channel it might go. Coming to Morocco, um, I think the, the question you were essentially asking, it was how do we approach a new country? How do we go into a new country? Um, and I mean, there are two connected answers to that. Essentially, it's project led or it always has been in the past. So we will go into a country where we see projects that require our support. Um, and as we get more project interest from that particular country or region, we will increase our capacity. Um, and I don't think, I, I'm not 100% sure, but I don't think we've ever had a project proposal from Morocco, but we've never advertised our services in Morocco, it has to be said, that I'm aware of. Um, we have been getting closer. We, we have been coming up to that part of, of Africa, but we haven't really, it's not a part that we've worked in uh, in a dedicated way to date. Um, and uh, uh, the other answer to your implied question is then we don't have a country coordinator in Morocco at the moment. The other part of the equation is of, obviously to be able to work in a country we need resources. And sometimes a particular funder or donor will say I would like you to work in that particular country. And that hasn't happened yet for, for Morocco I'm afraid. Um, but it might happen and you know I think certainly what I can say is that we will be expanding in and throughout Africa as we go forward with the scale-up plan. Um, we don't have any specific plans at the moment, we're formulating those. Um, you know, Central Africa is still very much uh, a blank space for us, and we're certainly the northern Maghreb uh, areas of, of, uh, of Africa are also un uncharted territory at the moment. Yeah, sure. Does it work? Yeah. Uh, just to, you mentioned the, the Centers for Clean uh, or Sustainable Development, I think they call. Uh, I mean, there is, a, there is, I think the area of cooperation with those centers will be at two levels, touches a little bit on what you said, Alexander, as well. Um, it's, it's project sourcing. That may be interesting. So when the scouts, the PFAN scouts go out and try to find the project, that is uh, a place to go to. And the Centers for Clean, uh, clean, clean solutions, they call it something like that. Yeah. Um, uh, for clean development, yeah. Clean production, that's right, yeah, clean production. Yeah. Um, uh, are definitely relatively well anchored very often in the thing. So they are, they are basically, you know, at that level important. The other point is then sharing experience, that the knowledge sharing at the other end of the, of the process, if you want. That is, um, uh, that is a thing that's very easily said. And do, doing that in a proper way for frontier markets is still uh, a very difficult thing to do. 
Um, but certainly those centers, again, will be places where people would look for that kind of information. So that's uh, an, another level of, of uh, integration. Yeah, and, and sorry, I, I did forget that question. I think, you know, with, with the transition to unit and REAP, there's a whole new universe of cooperation opportunity opening up to us. Um, so there's the cleaner production centers, there's the GCIP, which is the global clean uh, investment program, if I remember something like that, if I remember correctly. Um, we had an event in Vienna last week together with them. Uh, there's the regional centers, so the, the regional clean energy and yeah. renewable energy, uh, energy ECRI, efficiency centers, ECRI, SADCRI, yeah. um, and, and so on. And we are, you know, slowly or, or hopefully more quickly now coming to grips with the opportunities that this sort of uh, this new tie up with UNIDO offers us, but we're learning as we go along with these with these things. We have time for more questions. Have you done anything in Estonia? I think it's, it's there are people listening to us online. It's probably yeah. the best if they just this. Well, it's quite a distance, so. Have you done anything in the Caribbean? My country, Antigua, last year we got a low-income loan from Irina for renewable energy and wind for our desalination plants. We just got accredited to Adaptation Fund and got our $10 million project funded. And hopefully for the Green Climate Fund in July, we'll also get approval. So we have a large amount of renewables coming on stream. We have particular circumstances because we are prone to hurricanes, so we need systems that can close down easily, you know, was free because we are also close to the water. So, but I don't know if you have any interaction in the Caribbean as yet. Uh, I think there was someone else also who wanted, yeah. So maybe you can continue with your question there. Thank you. My name is Julia Schweiger from Germany. Uh, I have a short question regarding uh, your comparative view on the countries. How different do the country experience? How different are the country experiences, and how uh, how do you have broad lessons that you have uh, see across all the countries, or how do you have to target the programs and approaches to country specifics? Yes, uh, we can have another one also. Yes. Um, those are basically my questions, actually. So that's good. My first question was about your experience in small island um, developing states, and the second one about the sort of regional variation that you see and how transferable you find your model to be between different regions. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Shall we uh, give the word back to you then? Um, good and challenging questions. Thank you. Uh, Caribbean. Uh, we have been active in the Caribbean and we are active, continue to be there in a relatively low level, I have to say at the moment. That's going to change relatively quickly during the sort of course of this year towards the end and certainly into next year. Uh, we have um, a country, a regional coordinator based out of uh, Jamaica. We have resource on Trinidad and Tobago and we have um, I think also a resource on one of the other islands. I'm just trying to get to it. I want to say Aruba, um, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, we also do lots of work in the Caribbean area. So it's not completely uncharted territory. Um, as far as the Pacific, the small islands in the Pacific, completely uncharted as yet. Uh, we have, well, I say we have completely, it's not quite true. We've done one project on. Um, I wanted to say Fiji, but I'm worried it might no, be to Tonga. I think it's Tonga, yes. Tonga. Yeah. I saw it on the website. Yes, it's, sorry, it's, it's Tonga. Um, there was a time when I knew all of them you know, completely, but it's getting to such a scale now that I just, difficult to track, but I think it's Tonga. Um, but it really was a one-off project. Uh, we have, Martin mentioned it earlier, we have funding from Australia. Um, that funding is uh, programmed over the next years to kick in for us to be able to do work in the small island states in the Pacific specifically. It's also very important to UNIDO, as you might be aware. Um, there's a, a regional center uh, that's being set up or has just been set up there. Um, so long story short, uh, not yet, but very, very shortly we will be going there. Um, very well taken point about how transferable is the model. Um, it's worked in the Caribbean, 
uh, but it's been difficult, it's challenging. Uh, our costs are higher there, certainly. Um, we see different sorts of projects. Uh, we see smaller projects, we see different challenges. But I think fundamentally the logic still works in the sense that we have a, a model which can identify the projects and prepare them for investors. They're much smaller markets. Um, they're much more in, sort of enclosed on themselves and we have to work a lot harder. As a result of that, we envisage that we will probably end up doing some things differently in the, um, in the South Island, in, in, the, in, the, in the Pacific Islands. And when we revisit the Caribbean, probably there as well, um, we will probably have somewhat more of a programmatic approach rather than a project by project approach, we think. But we're, we're working on that as we speak. Um, I think generally one of the strengths of the PFAM model is it, it, it is transferable. Um, and, you know, it used to be a bit of a, support, a, a sport with some of our donors saying, you can't work in those countries. We went into Mozambique because the US essentially said, I bet you can't close a project in Mozambique. And we did. And we've proved the model in every country we've gone into uh, to date. Now, that doesn't mean it has to work in the future. But, uh, you know, having set this up now personally and having got lots of other people working around in the meantime that are doing this, I'm pretty convinced I see no reason why it shouldn't work pretty much everywhere. There will be some outliers where it just won't work for various reasons. But in most places, I think it can work. Just to say one sentence about that, I think that, you know, the question, are the countries the same or can you go in with the same thing into the different countries is when you work business specific, you will always be country specific, you will be policy specific, you'll be customer specific because the businesses need to relate to their customers and need to be able to actually make money out on the, on the back of the customer demand. So they need to provide value to the customers. This will always be country specific. That doesn't mean that the approaches that you take in principle uh, wouldn't be comparable between the different countries. PFAN is exactly the proof for that. But it's all but the country specific element is always going to be there, obviously, and very often even sub subnational. So I have a question then. Um, how do you announce your call for proposals? How do project developers know that there is a call going on? And uh, do you have any plans for Caribbean? Uh, the, the, the calls, well, the two things to say there, Michael, and thank you for the question because it probably got submerged in, in the presentation. Firstly, essentially, we are open 24-7, and this is certainly the, uh, the, the plan in the future. So regardless of whether we have a call open at a particular time, projects can approach us. They can submit a proposal. Uh, that will be automated through the website in the future at the moment is somewhat of a hybrid but essentially it's also sort of uh, at least uh, initiated through the website um, and we will look at that we will decide whether we work with it and whether we allocate resource to it um, the calls for proposals are also announced through the website we um, promote them uh, with as much fanfare as possible through our networks so, so through the network that we have through the network that reap has through the unidirect network through the UNFCCC network, through the Climate L, um, and all of those sort of other networks that are available to us. Um, and you know, I think normally when we do a call in the meantime, the number of people that we actively send an email to or a notice to probably approaches somewhere in the region of 20,000, um, if not more. Uh, and we're of course looking, and that's that's the reason for wanting to work with the other institutions out there. We know we're still missing chunks of, of the world um, and potential applicants. So that's the reason for wanting to work with other resource partners and strategic partners to access their networks. And Martin, you had you you were looking as if you wanted to say something. No. No? Okay. We still have time for some more questions. Oh, Peter, you didn't answer if you have any plans for Caribbean. Oh, sorry, I was trying to call that. <laughs> I, I don't like you. No, no, I, uh, we, we, we don't have any concrete plans at the moment, but uh, we, uh, we are in the process of programming some funding that is available or is, is becoming available to us. And I think that we will be looking at um, Central America and, and the Caribbean um, relatively shortly, probably towards the end of this year, beginning of next year.
Uh, and maybe you could tell us a little bit more about your plans in general for for our calls and so on. Um, yeah, thank you for the nice softball questions, um, but, but very, uh, very useful. So we are just about to announce a call for proposals for uh, the Asia region, um, for the Asia Clean Energy Financing Forum. That will be announced on Friday, uh, this week in fact, um, through the channels that I mentioned, but it will be on the website uh, later this week or early next week. Uh, we will follow that up shortly with um, a call for proposals in uh, southern and east Africa. It's a bit of a hybrid region uh, for various reasons, uh, but essentially cover covering southern, southern and eastern Africa. We have just selected uh, a, a group of projects from West Africa, uh, and we have been working recently also with projects from what we call the, the Central Asian and Eastern European region. Uh, so that covers Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, uh, and, and some of the other transition economies in, in the old CIS countries. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Okay. Yes, yeah, um, could you please uh, use the microphone? Yeah, the microphone. I don't know where it is now. Oh, you're yeah. beside it. Got it. Oh. Thanks. Um, do you work in partnership with any non sort of non government organisations at the national country level um, uh, associated with these projects, or it's sort of work with the banks um, and I can see various other clean technology sort of networks. Uh, well, I think I think the simple answer is yes. Um, it probably depend, depends a little bit on your definition. We we have two levels for whatever reason of, of partnership. Uh, the, the one level we call strategic partners, they would typically be IRENA, the African Development Bank, so the other institutions that have a very, very, that are also donor funded, that have a very sort of uh, compatible or, or similar mandate to us in, in, the, in the climate and clean energy space. And then the other, the other area is what we call resource partners. Now the resource partners are a much wider group and we have a, a, a sort of different interaction with them. And the interaction is very much uh, at the local or the country level and dependent on the resources that we require from time to time in those countries. Typically, they would be um, NGOs, they would be uh, associations and clubs, uh, so the, Re the Renewable Energy Association of, Ta of Tanzania, for instance, is one that occurs to me. Sometimes they are also or near organs or agencies of government. Uh, for instance, the rural electrification agencies. Uh, um, other ones would be uh, the private sector foundations. Um, now we we work with the we identify and work with these sort of organisations for a number of reasons. Firstly, to give us, if you like, an immediate footprint in a country that we work work, work in. Um, to give us access in that country. To align what we do with local government policy and local government thinking. And also naturally to be able to reach out to the institutions and other networks that are already in that country. The reason we call them resource partners is because we often invite them to work with us uh, and provide resources to the network, but on a non-cash basis. So we're not looking to them to provide funding, but for instance, if we do an event in Rwanda, um, we might want to work with the Rwanda Private uh, Sector Developers, Private Sector Energy Developers Association. Um, or if we do an event in Uganda, we might ask the Rural Electrification Agency of Uganda to help us with doing some of the local logistics and organizations, supplying us with a room, inviting some local people, that sort of thing. And of course, you know, particularly those sort of organizations feed into our understanding of the policy requirements in that particular country. So I think the answer is yes, um, but they tend to be more of the the near government and association types rather than pure NGOs. But you know, having said that, we, we do, we've worked with SMV um, and, and people like that in the past. Okay. 
Questions? Um, in, I'm from Antigua. We, we are very active. Sorry. I'm from Antigua. We are very, very active. Like last year, I did, I got a small amount of funds from the OAS. We were able to do install 10 solar systems on the structures of community group projects. And that created a big demand. You know, people want, but the financing is very limited. Systems, you know, it's not really pushing, pushing the demand because the more people convert to renewable energies, the less income for the monopoly utility company who is saddled with debt from some fossil fuel plant. So you have to really find your own sources of financing to meet the public demand. And um, a lot of the banking institutions, I mean, you know, they're not, they hear about it, but to have a line allocated for financing for renewables, not really there yet. So the government itself, through some of these grant fundings that we are getting, are opening up pilot schemes, low interest to help the common people because we have the climate proof the structures it's very important we are suffering from drought people need water we do have the high sun but the electricity costs are still 50 cents us a kilowatt so you know it's crippling some operations and um, we have to find solutions for this so i don't know what we can do <laughs> Well, Martin might have some thoughts on this, and Martin, I'm thinking of the the, the Zambian uh, deal. Perhaps, perhaps you could. I, I just think um, there is at the moment a tendency, especially with off-grid solar, to establish systems everywhere which are only consumer uh, consumer finance driven. And when you look at the history of electrification in Europe or in North America. There were phases where that was tried as well. There were competing mini grids actually in the 19th century, and they were ended all in tears. And it didn't work, and it had it needed the state to come in with public finance and develop systems which at the time were state of the art. Now we still have some of those, and that and that big utilities that we refer to are kind of the reminders, the remainders of that. Um, but the system is changing again, um, and um, and uh, we we need to realize that there is a public finance component which needs to come in, even when we talk about off-grid, because even off-grid has an infrastructure component. And so uh, I think one of the really important questions for the, for the years to come now, and even facing us now, is how to target that public finance most effectively so they can prepare the ground for private services to then uh, you know, come on top of that. It's, it can't happen just through private finance alone, not in a sustainable long-term way and not in a way that's really then available to everybody. Um, so th there needs to be, that's what blended finance in the widest sense of the word is actually about. Um, so th that's one thing that's very close to the heart of my organization in addition to PFAT and building on the work that PFAT does with individual companies is to say what, is, what are the best ways of injecting, injecting public finance into, um, into markets without disrupting the market but with helping frontier markets to establish themselves and, and, and grow into more commercially able and, and sustainable markets. And that's where the information component comes in because no market is going to exist if there is no information flow um, and no investment is going to flow if there's no information about the market. So, so it's, it's kind of a spy. We try not to have a, a, a negative circle, but a positive spiral. Did we run out to question or do we have a final one? Okay. Do you want to say something concluding, or <laughs> I think we are we are we are then ending. I thank you very much for for listening and for your questions, and thank you, Martin and Peter, for the presentations.